I know some good therapists who will help you work that out. I think the Ten Commandments are like this, and hasn't Chris done an excellent job this morning of reminding us of that? They're a firm no by God, not this, given not to punish us, but to provide boundaries that would keep us safe, keep our community safe. You can't have neighbors, not for long, if you don't mutually agree to respect each other's stuff, space, and relationships. As the poet Robert Frost said, good fences make good neighbors. Now, most scholars think that the Beatitudes in Matthew chapters 5 through 7 are the gospel writer's way of arranging all of Jesus' teachings in such a way that it presents Jesus as the new Moses, a, a new lawgiver. A.J. Levine, a, a biblical scholar, says, there's no way Jesus said all this at once. Their heads would explode. <laughs> and we didn't read it for today, but in the passage just before the long passage that we read, Jesus says he came not to do away with the law, meaning the covenant relationship between God and the Israelites outlined by Moses, nor that he came to do away with the prophets who arose before and during the exile when Israel had lost the promised land and was seeking to understand how something they had thought would last forever barely lasted a couple centuries. Now, if you've been an adult Sunday school, you know this, but remember that prophets had two main points. Number one, Israel was to honor God and God only, and the reason uh, in the prophet's view that Israel lost the promised land was because they failed to honor one God. Uh, and also that Israel was supposed to live in covenant relationship with its neighbors expressed by justice and loving kindness. And Israel had failed on that account too. Love God with everything you are and your neighbor as yourself, right? Now, Jesus says he's not giving a new teaching. Rather, he is fulfilling what was already expressed in the law and the prophets. Now, there's no extra charge for this. But the law and prophets do not disagree with each other. Both are pointing us to right relationship with God, excuse me, expressed in covenant worship and justice-oriented relationships with our neighbors. Most importantly for us, the law and prophets do not disagree with Jesus. Luke tells us Jesus begins his ministry by reading from Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. When the law says, do not murder, do not commit adultery, the prophets agree with that, and Jesus agrees as well. These boundaries make covenant relationship possible, a covenant of life and of faithfulness. If you've ever lived through the wrongful taking of life of a loved one, or if you've ever been wronged by an unfaithful spouse, you know in a deep, visceral way why these boundaries were put in place and the chaos that comes when they are disregarded. In this part of the Sermon on the Mount, which is for me the part where I feel like my head is going to explode, Jesus is going deeper than the rules or behaviors deeper than actions, and he's going into the internal world that we live in that gives rise to our actions. As old Deuteronomy sings in Cats, they had the experience but missed the meaning. Jesus is all about the meaning, not the what, but the why. What is going on that led to the behavior? Now, my guess is that every one of us here today felt some kind of ooch when hearing this text read. Now, maybe you can breathe deep in the beginning. Well, I've, I've never done murder, right? I mean, we're, okay. But 
anger. Weekly, sometimes daily. I don't think I've ever called someone an idiot to their face. But in my mind, when I replay that conversation and I get to say in private what I wish I had been able to say to the person, fool, idiot, many choice words rise to the surface. Don't commit adultery. I'm I'm on safe ground there. But it's a good thing we're not literalists because most, if not all of us, would be missing a body part otherwise in Jesus' teaching about lust. Making a pledge. Whenever I get called for jury duty, which is more often than you might think, I I watch people put their hands on a Bible to swear to tell the truth. I watch politicians do the same thing. And I promise you, I think for many of them, they may as well put their hands on a stack of playing cards. Jesus says, let your yes be a yes, and your no be a no. In her book, Gifts of Imperfection, Brene Brown describes some of the transformations that people embrace as they're seeking to live with more vulnerability. She calls them guideposts. Things like cultivating authenticity by letting go of what other people think, or cultivating self-compassion by letting go of perfectionism. And guidepost number six is cultivating creativity and letting go of comparison. And as I was thinking about that arc of transformation, the blessing of boundaries became really clear to me in that moment. Because these feelings and longings and thoughts, the things that come before the actions that Jesus is describing, the feelings of anger or lust, all the seven deadly sins, I think all of them are rooted in selfishness and comparison. And church Comparison is the thief of joy. The first murder in the Bible was between two brothers. Think of that. (laughs) Cain killed his brother Abel because his offering was not acceptable. His anger rose from comparing himself with his brother. Now, this happens in the fourth chapter of Genesis, so it's very, very early in the story. Comparison is the thief of joy. In this case, it was also the thief of life. I I often wonder if the impulse of lust is also about comparison. And if it is true, which I think it is, that the boundaries of marriage actually help foster creativity. Joni Mitchell wrote... I read an article that said, if you want endless repetition, see a lot of different people. If you want infinite variety, stay with one. She said, what happens when you date is you run all your best moves and tell all your best stories. And in a way, that routine is a method for falling in love with yourself over and over. You can't do that with a long-time mate because he knows all your old material. With a long relationship, things die, then are rekindled. And that shared process of rebirth deepens the love. It's hard work, though, and a lot of people run at the first sign of trouble. You're with this person, and suddenly you look like a jerk to them, or they look like a jerk to you. It's unpleasant, but if you can get through it, You get closer, and you learn a way of loving that's different from the neurotic love enshrined in movies. It's warmer. It has more padding to it. So that's my Valentine's message to you today who might need a reminder. Comparison is the thief of joy, and it happens most of the time without our conscious knowledge of it. So what Jesus is doing 
He's really asking us to pay attention to the thoughts and feelings that come before the actions. Sometimes people do awful, hateful, sinful, evil things because someone in authority tells them to. This is what philosopher Hannah Arendt called the banality of evil. She was referring to the incredulity of mild-mannered teachers and postal workers willingly committing acts of torture against their neighbors who were Jewish because the Nazis told them to. But usually our actions arise from feelings. I think Jesus was remembering both the law and the prophets when he taught here. Specifically, I think he was remembering the prophet Jeremiah who wrote, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. I will put my instructions within them and engrave them on their hearts. They will no longer need to teach each other to say, know the Lord, because they'll all know me from the least of them to the greatest. A covenant of the heart. Well, I didn't start out intending to have a Valentine sermon today, but maybe it's helpful. A covenant of the heart addresses intentions, not just actions. The why, not just the what. There are limits and boundaries, and they are blessings. There are limits to marriage because bringing others into the marriage covenant destroys it. There are limits to taking a life because life is sacred, not yours to give and therefore not yours to take. Now, sorting out the thoughts and feelings that give rise to action, for most of us that is the work of a lifetime. So don't worry if you haven't got all of that sorted out by the time you go to sleep tonight. If anything, having Jesus speak about our motivations, it's a call for grace for all of us. It's a way to talk about the reality that if salvation is up to us, we are in trouble. Because by the time you can read these words of Jesus for yourself, you will already have experienced the full gamut of emotion, including anger and lust. Our emotions are a real, necessary, unavoidable part of our humanity. We cannot escape them and we should not want to. What we can do is learn to recognize them, how they show up in our bodies, and we can learn how to respond instead of react to their messages. Emotions clue us in that there is a need we have that's perhaps not getting the attention it needs right now. So paying attention to what the emotions are about allows us to create space between our emotions and what we're, what we're dealing with so that we can respond rather than react. And that's what allows us to do no harm. So before our heads explode with the impossibility of keeping these words, and before our hearts explode with stress of acknowledging our emotions, let me offer a word of grace. Jesus knows us, and he loves us, and he forgives us. And then he offers us to a better way of life. The better way, by the way, is not having no emotions, but trusting that Christ who knows and loves us has forgiven us and will be with us as we learn to let go of comparison and learn really to live with the trust that the love of Christ really is better than silver, or better than gold, that it can be trusted. A book I come back to time and time again is called Falling Upward by Richard Rohr. He talks about necessary suffering, the things that happen to us, in us, by us, that cause the armor we have built up in order to deal with life. It causes that armor to be inadequate. All of us will encounter a loss for which we are unprepared 
it's just the way of life. We spend, he says, the first half of our life building a container, um, if you will. I would call that building a rule book by which we will do life um, and find success and feel invincible. Now, I want to say this kindly. Many of the things that happen to us in our lives are not things that we cause. When we're talking about that and perhaps talking about a traumatic loss, we might begin with the words, what happened to you, okay? We don't begin, how is that somehow your fault? However, (laughs) there are things in our lives that we do cause and bring on ourselves and cause harm to others. And that's why the Christian life has the practice of confession and forgiveness of sin, so that we can practice being truthful about our mistakes and our faults and feel the life-changing experience of being loved despite our failings despite our deliberate choices that harm others, despite our willful ignorance of somebody else's suffering, despite our prideful choices made from a place of feeling inadequate. And by the way, for United Methodists, that's what Wesley meant when he talked about his Aldersgate moment. If we're willing to be truthful, about our mistakes and our sins, the place where we did not honor the boundaries set up by God, hear me, please hear me, we really can experience divine forgiveness. And that's what leads to spiritual growth and maturity. That's what Rohr calls the second half of life. Now, first and second half of life does not refer to chronological age. You and I have known old souls, haven't we? People whose heavy losses came when they were young, who have integrated them and somehow become wise. But we also, all of us I'm sure, know perpetual teenagers, grown-ups who still are not willing to take responsibility and accountability for their actions. Now, when I tell you that, I'm going to say that's an insult to teenagers because the teenagers I know take responsibility for their lives more than many adults. When we become spiritually mature, growing up in Christ, no longer being babies who need milk, that's when we're living from the second half of life and our thoughts and feelings can become more in line with our behaviors. We no longer do something just because an authority figure tells us to do it, but rather because we know within us what Jeremiah called having the covenant written on our hearts. We know within us that living inside the blessing of boundaries is what leads to a good and beautiful life. Rohr says, in the second half of life, we can give our energy to making even the painful parts and the excluded parts belong. If you've forgiven yourself for being imperfect, you can now do it for just about everybody else. If you haven't done it, you'll pass on your judgment to others. Church, I watch with great joy those of you who are living lifetime love. You're what makes me believe in it. I see how you would rather suffer yourself than watch your mate suffer. I see how your smiles widen when your love walks into the room. I see that you would no more walk away than you would stop breathing. And I want to say thank you. Thank you for giving witness to the deep joy of covenant love and faithfulness. Bill and Dorothy Quick, and it's not the Bill Quick who went to Metropolitan Church in in Detroit, it's a different Bill. They were members of my church when I was in college, and she was my supervisor in my summer job. Now, Bill and Dorothy, by the time I knew them, were in their 70s, maybe even their 80s. They were both short and stout. They had been quite good-looking in their youth, 
but you'd have to really know that to see it in them now. What they were after 50 years of marriage was covenanted together. And one day he came to pick her up from work, and the moment he walked into the room, her entire countenance changed. Her eyes grew larger, her shoulders raised, her features softened. She leaned over to me and said, 50 years and I could still eat him with a spoon. (laughs) Your chariot awaits, he bowed to her as he offered his arm. She grabbed her purse and his arm, and I'm pretty sure I saw at least one of them kick up their heels as they headed out the door. They didn't need a rule book to tell them to keep choosing each other. That covenant was written on their hearts. Jesus is always inviting us to that kind of life, a life of integrity. Integrity isn't perfection. Integrity is being willing to be seen and known and loved and forgiven by Christ. To be loved like that really is to find yourself. That's the blessing of boundaries. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.